So I have alluded to the fact that a net present value equaling zero does not mean zero profit. It means nothing in excess of the required rate of return, but when it equals zero, it means it is returning exactly what we want it to return. So in other words, <clears throat> net present value equal to zero implies that, it implies two things. It implies that your original investment is recovered and that the required rate of return is realized and nothing more. So when we get a net present value of zero, we shouldn't look at it and say, well, I'm indifferent. We should look at it saying, hey, that means that I get all my money back that I, that I originally invested plus all the required rate of return that I needed. <clears throat> so let me prove that that is true. Let us say we're looking at a project in which we part with $3,170 today. In exchange for that, we will receive $1,000 at the end of the year for four years. The asset will have no salvage value. Required rate of return in this case is 10%. So what is the net first thing? What is the net present value? Well, in Excel, NPV, net present value equals our 0.1. The first thing we enter is our required rate of return, comma. Remember now, we don't enter cash flows at time zero. We start at time one. So the time zero, we ignore. The 3,170, we ignore. We go right to the 1,000. And we have four of those. That is the net present value of the cash inflows minus the net present value of the cash outflow is exactly what it is. We're parting with that today. We will get a net present value of zero. And this is, this is and I'm taking a bit of time on this, and the book uh, takes some time on it too, because we get so used to looking at zero and saying it's nothing that we forget that embedded within that zero is our required rate of return. Now, we're also going to cover off a couple of assumptions here. So before I prove this to you, let me uh, make a note here about the first assumption of net present value. All cash flows are at the end of the period. Notice that they're at the end of the period. This is an, an ordinary annuity. Now, the reason we make a point of saying it's at the end of the period because it's not really true. We just assume that it is because once we invest the 3170 it's going to start making money during the course of the year. It's not like we go all year with nothing, then we get one payment. It's during the, the full year it will return 1000 During the second year, it will return another 1000 So if we want to be a little more precise, we might say that, well, the cash flows really occur in the middle of the year because we get some at the beginning and some at the end if it's continuous. We don't know if it's continuous. We don't know what the distribution of the income looks like. So we simply make the simplifying assumption that it occurs at the end of the period. It does not reflect reality. I, I'll tell you that right now. So if you're struggling with this thing, but that, how, how, it doesn't make sense. Well, it's not, it's not supposed to. It's just supposed to get us close. It's an estimate. So we assume, we make the simplifying assumption that all the cash flows just happen at the end of the period, and let's just leave it at that, okay? So let's see if this actually works. Let's see if a net present value of zero does these two things. We want our original investment back, and we want our full required rate of return. So let's go. We invest $3,170 today. We'll get a cash inflow of $1,000. But we need a 10% ROI. Our investment is $3,170. So $317 of this $1,000 is just the return on investment we need, which means only $683 is our recovery of investment. Do you get that? Out of the first $1,000, because our investment is $3,170, the 317 of it, we will say, well, that's our profit. We can't count that for anything else. That's our profit. So 683 is what's left over. That's part of the recovery of the original 3170 that we spent. So our unrecovered amount is now 2487, 2487. So at the beginning of the year two, we have $2,487 invested. We need to achieve a 10% return on that. That is rounded off $249, which means out of the $1,000 cash flow, $751 is part of the return of our original investment. 
2487 minus 751, 7, 1736 left over. Beginning year three, we have 1736. We need to make 10% on that, 173, which means 827 is our recovery of investment. So we still need to recover $909. Going into year four, we have 909. 10% of that is $91 which means our return recovery of investment is 909 amount recovered is zero sorry uh, unrecovered amount now is zero so i have shown you now that by removing the 10 percent we completely recover our investment we completely recover our investment here's recovery of investment here if we add up all these numbers we get to three thousand one hundred and seventy dollars and you can see that we've recovered, we've taken 10% every year out on ROI. So we've gotten our 10% and nothing more. We've recovered our investment and nothing more. So let's make another assumption. Let's, or I'll show you another assumption. Assumption number two. These are the two big assumptions of net present value. All cash flows can be reinvested at the same required rate of return. So in other words, this $317 can be reinvested at 10% for three years. This $249 can be reinvested at 10% for two years. This $173 can be reinvested at 10% for one year. Uh, and that will give us uh, a full 10% return. We're assuming two things. What I've done here, I've shown you, well, let me, let me just clear that up. I've shown you two things here. I have shown you that a net present value of zero implies two things. It implies that our original investment is recovered and that our required rate of return is realized. So anything greater than zero is an automatic accept Anything less than zero is an automatic reject. I've also shown you the two assumptions that underlie net present value. Assumption number one, all cash flows are at the end of the period. And number two, all cash flows can be reinvested at the same rate of return. So that when we get this cash flow, this ROI of $317 in the first year, then we want to invest that in other projects that have a net present value greater than zero as well. Where that fails is when you look at a company that year over year over year just piles up cash on its balance sheet. Well, that cash is not being reinvested at the required rate of return. That is idle cash. That should be a problem. For you as an investor, you should be saying you're not putting that money to work. Give it back to me then. I'm the shareholder. So this actually, uh, this assumption here, actually uh, gives you some idea of how you can evaluate a company <clears throat> that really just collects a lot of cash. If it's not paying it back in dividends and it's not reinvesting it, it's underperforming its cost of capital, isn't it? So this was a nice little screen to go through because we got two things out of the way. We got a proof of, of a positive net present value being an accept. And we've covered off our two assumptions. Don't forget these two assumptions now. We've covered off our two assumptions that underlie all of net present value. Well, let's take a minute and just talk about the discount rate. How are we discounting these cash flows? Where do we get that discount rate? Well, typically, uh, when you take a course in corporate finance, you will learn that it is the weighted average cost of capital. And we just shorten it to WACC. So whenever you see WACC, you know that that is a discount rate applied to cash flows to evaluate projects. Well, that's a lot of words, weighted average cost of capital. What does it all mean? Well, let's break it down and I'll show you where every word comes from. The cost of capital. Well, capital comes in two forms, right? It comes in either debt or equity. And what we want to know is, well, what proportion of our assets are financed with debt? What proportion of our assets are financed with equity? So we'll take debt and we'll divide it by debt plus equity and we'll get some percent. Then we'll take our equity and we'll divide it by debt plus equity and we'll get one minus X percent. So if debt represents X percent of our financing, 
equity must represent 1 minus x because these two fractions, if you add these two together, they will equal debt plus equity over debt plus equity, which equals 1. So the proportion of each, when you add the two proportions together, must also equal 1. So these are called weights. So when we want to know, when we talk about weights, uh, X percent is the weight, uh, uh, the percentage of our assets financed by debt. That's the weighting that we give to debt. And 1 minus X percent is the percentage of our assets financed by equity. And we give that, uh, that percentage weight. But debt has a cost. Not only does it represent a certain percentage of how we finance our assets, but debt has a cost, typically the interest rate. Debt is not free. It has a cost, right? And equity has a cost. When we uh, sell shares, there's a return on equity. That equity belongs to the shareholders, really. So it has a cost as well. So what we want to do to figure out our weighted average cost of capital is our weighted average cost of capital would have to be what percentage the weighting is debt multiplied by the cost of debt and we add that to the percentage that's equity, the weighting for equity, multiplied by the cost of equity. Now, for those who have taken corporate finance, you may say, that's not quite how it's done. No, I'm just, I'm just giving you a broad example. How we calculate the cost of debt is different than just saying interest, and how we calculate cost of equity is different than just saying ROE, but that's for a corporate finance course. So, what do we have here? We have the weighted average, the weighted average cost of capital. Weighted average cost of capital. Isn't that nice? And that is the discount rate. For the purpose of an accounting course, the weighted average cost of capital will just be given to you in a problem if you're going to solve a problem. Here's, here's what WAC is. If this were a corporate finance course, you'd be given a bunch of information. You'd be given the capital structure. You'd be given the, the beta on, on the company versus the market. And you'd be asked to solve for the weighted average cost of capital. So once you take corporate finance, you're going to see this again, and you're going to derive the weighted average cost of capital instead of having it being given to you. But at least you can understand, okay, I get it now, the weighted average cost of capital. It makes sense for a corporation to use that because you have to cover off your cost of your capital, right? And that's your ROE, or that's the, the return on investment you need is at least your cost of capital.